Hi, Bob. <laughs> I've been working on the most recent His Chem show, and the mid-afternoon sugar lows have struck. Are you what a surprise. Yep. <laughs> it always happens, same time every day. Are you interested in going to get a snack? Sure. I'm working on the same show, so perfect time for a break. Why don't we uh, head on down to the uh, corner deli there and pick up something yep. sweet? Sounds good. Okay. So what are you in the mood for? I'm always in the mood for chocolate. Okay, well, we'll find something sweet and chocolatey in the corner deli around, uh, around the corner. How about that? That sounds good, and that'll keep me going for the rest of the afternoon. Yeah, I can't believe how warm it is at this time of year. Thank you. Okay, I see the chocolates over there. Look at here. Tasty cakes. That's real Philadelphia. <laughs> I've never had a tasty cake. You've lived here how long and you've never had a tasty cake? Four years. Never Four had years? a take never had a tasty cake. Oh, no. we gotta do this. Chocolate and tasty cake. It Let's has see. to be chocolate. Okay. It has to be chocolate. Here's some chocolate cupcakes. How about that? Okay. Or, or, would, or would you like a glazed chocolate pie? I'll go for the cupcakes. We are indeed, we're buying two tasty cakes. This is my first time to try it. First bite ever. Okay, this will be good. So, what do you think? Not what I expected. It's not actually not as sweet as I expected it to be, but there's a taste in there. I can't place it. I don't know where it, what it is. Yeah, I would really expect it to be sweet because the number one ingredient is sugar. Well, there's a lot of ingredients here. Sugar, water, bleached enriched flour, which has lots of things in it, vegetable shortening, soybean oil, palm oil. Oh, and it's got the partially hydrogenated oils. Right, they don't Pumpkin. use animal fat anymore. No. All vegetable oils. And it's also got citric acid and TBH something. What do they do? <laughs> Doesn't it say to preserve freshness? Oh yeah, yeah, added to yeah. preserve freshness. Yeah, that, that's called a shelf life extender. Okay. They, uh, they get that uh, stuff in there so that they can leave it packaged on the shelf for a longer period of time. What about the high fructose corn syrup? That's just more sweetness. Okay. This has a lot more ingredients than I expected a chocolate cake would have, which raises the question for me, how did food get this processed? Well, that's an awfully good question. Let's go find out. Hello and welcome to His Chem, a history show that helps us connect science and technology to the world we live in. I'm Mikhail Meyer, a historian of science and editor of Chemical Heritage magazine here at CHF. And I'm Bob Kenworthy. I'm a chemist and I also work here at CHF. Our show tonight is titled, Why the Chicken Became a Nugget and Other Tales of Processed Food. And our guests are Brian Simon and David Schleifer. David researches and writes about food, technology, and healthcare He's a senior research associate at Public Agenda in New York. And he has the distinction of also doing research here at CHF on the history of trans fats. Brian's a professor of history at Temple University. He writes about food, drink, and popular culture. I guess that's wine, women, and song or something like that, isn't it, Brian? <laughs> and, and he's currently conducting a broad-ranging study on the high cost of cheap food. He's written a book. He's written a book that's called Everything but the coffee. Learning about America from Starbucks. So trans fats has hit the news again recently with the FDA's proposal to ban it. announcement from the government today that affects us all and what we eat. Good evening. The FDA announcing the federal government plans to phase out trans fats. Food and Drug Administration announces it will ban all trans fats nationwide. You probably wonder, what are trans fats doing in our food in the first place? I want to start off with the big picture. What is processed food and when did we start eating it? And I already have a Twitter question comment from David Kroll who says, 
My guess, food got highly processed during post-World War II suburbanization, stopped walking past fresh food daily. So as part of your answer, um, Brian, if you want to start us off with that and um, get us going on when did we first start eating processed food? Yeah, I think that would be the common answer to look at processed food as a post-World War II development, but that would really sort of erase a long history. I mean, there's almost no time when people didn't try to preserve food, make it more convenient, and really enhance some flavors over others. I mean, if you think of the kind of that magical study of cod and salting cod as a way to discover the new world, that's processed food. I'm the chemist here, so what's the chemistry intended to do here? Right, well, so I think that, um, you know, again, talking about the chemistry of processed food really requires talking about um, the chemistry of various different processed foods. So if you think about something like a, a TV dinner, um, you might have hundreds of different components in there um, that all are subject to different forms of processing. So um, the case that I know best is, um, is trans fats. And trans fats are a type of dietary fat. What they're found in is something called partially hydrogenated soybean oil, usually soybean oil, you can do it with any kind of any oil, oil. But, um, but it's in a way, it's a sort of a prototypical processed food because soybean oil on its own has a tendency to go rancid very quickly because of its rate of oxidation. So what partial hydrogenation does is um, it, when, when you subject liquid oil to a catalytic process, you end up with an oil that's more oxidatively stable. So basically, it doesn't go rancid as quickly. Um, it doesn't smell. And you can use it for all sorts of other processed foods. So you can use it to cook chips or french fries. You can um, use it in baked goods. And all of those things have a longer shelf life if they're used, if they're made using partially hydrogenated oils. Um, and that, that's one of the really important considerations with any kind of processed food is shelf life, because usually these things are shipped over long distances and stored for fairly long periods of time. And unprocessed foods um, don't last that long on the shelf. Yeah. And, and I'd love to get into the details of conjugated double bonds and why they oxidize <laughs> faster, uh, but, but I'm going to stay away from that. Right, right, right. <laughs> How does a chicken nugget get made? I mean, obviously it does not come into existence in the supermarket like a lot of kids Oh, yes, think. it does. It no, does. I'm just <laughs> <laughs> You can breed chicken nuggets in your supermarket yes. I mean, <laughs> someday. So, the, the man who's credited with inventing the chicken nugget was a Cornell poultry science professor by the name of Robert Baker. And um, I recently talked to one of his colleagues, and his colleagues told me he hated waste. And in some ways, that's where the chicken nugget came from. There were spare chicken parts that couldn't be used. Chicken that couldn't be taken off the bone, so they actually developed a system that would blow the chicken off the bone. Um, hair dryer, kind of? Yeah, like, like, a, like a hair okay. dryer. Um, beaks, feet, skin, all that couldn't be used. And so he began to develop a product that would basically grind up all of this not used chicken. And he would add a filler um, and a binding agent to it. And he figured out to create a, a filler and a binding agent that allowed for breading to be on top of it. And this was really the, the hard thing that he figured out and then fried it up. <laughs>